This is the Amazon Planet Podcast, Episode 10, An Opportunity to Develop. I'm your host, Joel Amadon, and I hope this recording finds you well. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Also, thank you to all of you out there for sharing, subscribing, and reviewing. Anytime anyone does any of those actions, it makes the podcast a little bit more viewable uh, to others trying to find it, uh, find similar sorts of content. It helps me learn how to make the podcast better. Ultimately, it makes a better product. So thank you, anyone that does any of those things. And if you haven't thought about it, sharing, subscribing, or reviewing, please take the time to do that. Uh, Speaking of support, uh, I also want to let you know about an opportunity to support the podcast, uh, celebrate my 41st birthday, and get yourself a nice t-shirt or hoodie. I I have created some swag, some Amazon Planet, Amazon Planet podcast swag to sell. And my goal is to uh, sell 41 shirts or hoodies for my 41 years on this earth coming up within the next week uh, at the drop of this podcast and all uh all of it is for the purpose of supporting the production cost of the podcast that it ain't free to to put this out there but um i enjoy doing it and uh just thought maybe it'd be a nice thing if uh anyone wanted to support and get themselves a, a little uh t-shirt or hoodie uh, might be a good way to do that so if you are interested in taking a look at the offerings, just head to the show notes for this episode, amadonplanet.com forward slash episode 10, where you'll find a link to the Amazon Planet store. There's also a link in the header at amadonplanet.com. Uh, in the store, you'll find a couple of designs and a variety of colors and styles that you may like. Just check it out. If you like something, get something. And if not, thanks for considering. And let me know what you might be interested in purchasing in the future. Uh, for example, my sister-in-law said offering some onesies for babies might be a good idea. Noted. And we're actually working on that currently. Um, And, okay, so you know what? Let's get to the show, which ties in perfectly with the purpose of the Amazon Planet podcast, which is learning how to teach better. And the goal of the podcast, and my own personal goal, is to lead people to love others through teaching. And so usually on episodes of the podcast, uh, we feature a book and try to extract learnings from it in order to consider how to get better at teaching. In this episode, we are featuring an event right? An experience, specifically the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, which we call NCTM lovingly, uh, regional conference. Uh, It was held in Nashville, Tennessee in early October. Yes, the math nerds descended on Music City to discuss how to teach math better, and it was glorious. Uh, Now, for those of you out here there who are not teachers or not math teachers, you might be considering hit the pause button or moving on to another podcast. Wait, 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 just, just, just hold on a second. Thinking about, think about this for a second. You might get insight into what happens at a conference for math teachers. Aren't you a bit curious, huh? You wondering what's going on? Seriously, though, no matter what your occupation role, especially with the ever-evolving role of technology, continuing education or professional development is part of what keeps us at our best within those occupations or roles, right? Things are always changing, and so we always need to keep developing. So hearing how folks from a variety of occupations or roles within the world of education have developed as professionals within the same experience is kind of interesting, right? Huh? So thinking about what stands out, why that thing was meaningful, and how does one apply that meaningful moment to what they do on a day-to-day basis is the constant cycle of professional reflection that makes us all better. And so you're going to hear that. You're going to hear a a variety of folks uh, experiencing that. So... Uh, within this podcast. So, and anyway, because somewhere, somewhere I heard this phrase, I don't go to a professional development because just by going, it is not guaranteed that I will develop as a professional, right? Because some people say, hey, I got a professional development on Tuesday. Well, yeah, it it isn't guaranteed, right? It's not guaranteed that you're going to grow as a professional just by mere attendance, right? They don't just down, it's not like uh, the matrix where they you know, put a cord into you and it just downloads and all of a sudden you know kung fu. That's not what we're talking about here. So I I believe my friend Courtney Kessler said this thing about this idea about professional development, that you have the opportunity to develop as a professional when you go to an event like this. So instead of thinking about it as uh, something where you just absorb learning, I have to position myself in a way that I'm going to learn. It kind of goes back to the last episode of the podcast. We're teaching with problems, episode nine. Go back and check that out. I really actually just listened to it. I kind of like that episode. Um, And where we talked about one thing that I pulled from the book featured in that episode was the separation of teaching and learning. And that's really what 
you know, this phrase about having the opportunity to develop as a professional kind of comes from where the people that put on a professional development have created an experience for people to learn from, right? But it's how I, as a participant, or whoever the participant is, uh, approach that experience, how I interact with that experience that determines whether or not I learn, or in this case, develop as a professional, okay? So that's what you, where we're going to get at today. And, and so this is, a, again, the NCTM Regional Conference in Nashville, Tennessee, which was the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, just to review. And NCTM is an interesting organization. If you look, if you think about the standards movement and where people have gotten together and thought about what should people know about certain kinds of content, where you know, this idea of standards, I mean, really kind of started with NCTM back in 89, 1989, where they developed their first set of standards, where this professional organization got together and said, hey, here's what's important. We're going to write it down in this document called the standards, and we're going to distribute it, disseminate it to our membership. And so from there, really kind of setting the stage in that 1989 document, if you look back at it, they were kind of radical. They kind of took out some things with regards to standard algorithms, like the way that some of you might have learned uh, what when you think about multiplication and division and all that stuff, these standard algorithms that people kind of know and somewhat love. Uh, when you think about that, you're thinking about... Um, you know, your relationship with mathematics kind of might be tied to those things where NCTM kind of said, Hey, you know what? It's the understanding behind those things. That's important. Not necessarily the algorithms kind of radical at the time. And so they've kind of been a four, well, they've been, they've been a four leader in uh, thinking about pushing forward their field uh, with regards to teaching and mathematics. NCTM has been a great place where I have been shoved professionally uh, many, many times and when we're going to talk about in the episode, being shoved professionally is not a bad thing. It's like where your thinking and beliefs, one of those things gets shoved and you have to figure out how to put them back in alignment because of something you said or, or something you heard or something you did or something you experienced at the conference, which is really why you go to a conference is to get these sorts of professional shoves so you can advance yourself, uh, which might mean that your either philosophy or beliefs fall out of action and you're going to hear more about that during our uh, podcast here. Well, and so the, the setup for this podcast, again, unlike others, is I'm actually going to be interviewing five people, right? So five folks agreed to sit down with me to talk about how they, like an instance of how they developed as a professional during this conference. And so I had three students, Claire, Kaylee, and Amelia, and then uh, two colleagues, um, Dr. Ann Monroe and Ms. Candice Cook uh, got to got to talk to all of them, and what they basically did was identify one thing that they identified as something that stood out to them from the conference, right? So one moment, one you know, if they were going to have a put a mile marker or some sort of thing of their professional development in the in the, and I'm, I'm making this the motion of putting a sign in the ground and you can't see that, but putting a stake in the ground saying, Hey, this is the moment where I developed as a professional. And this is the, the session. This is the, what was said, like have them identify something from the conference that they can highlight that this was meaningful for me. And then think about why was it meaningful and how does it apply to what they're going to be doing in the classroom? And so each of them did that. You're going to hear that, the series of five of them each go through that experience as I talk to them about it. And then what we'll do is we'll come back and we'll talk about what we heard, maybe clear up some terminology or lingo and stuff, and then we'll wrap up the episode. I'm just excited to for you all to hear how these individuals have, one, they selected to go to the conference, and two, how they developed as professionals through it. Enjoy. Hey. Claire, thank you for uh, coming in and uh, talking with me. Why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself to the uh, listeners. Um, so I'm Claire Gershon. I'm from Oxford, and I'm majoring in elementary education, and my concentrations are math and science, and I would love to teach in, like, a fifth-grade math class after I graduate. Sweet. Wants to do that in mathematics. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's great. Just got to keep I, – I, that just puts pressure on me to keep it going, you know. <laughs> so um, – Again, thank you for going to the conference in NCTM, uh, and I'm just excited to hear. And, I, and we talked a little bit before about it, but just what's that one thing that stood out to you at the conference, that, that one learning? 
Um, definitely, I went to a session on curiosity, and the speaker um, talked about how if you gave a kid a toy that had four functions, the kid, and you showed the kid one of the functions, the kid would only ever do that one function. But if you just handed the toy to the kid, the kid's going to figure it all out for themselves and probably learn even more about the toy than you even knew. That's, I mean, so it's almost like, you know, you think you're teaching them something, but you're actually, in, in teaching them that one function, you're actually stealing the mm-hmm. opportunity for learning the other ones. And that's, I, I, I've heard that before about stealing the learning and, like, how we want to avoid that. And, like, you know, think about how much, what, three more things they learn from this mm-hmm. one toy, but, like, stealing the learning, like, that's something we need to avoid. And so, yeah, okay, so you learn that one thing, and that sounds like an amazing talk. So what does that mean for you and your future classroom and or your future students? I definitely want to make sure that my classroom gives students the opportunity to be curious and um, to explore things for themselves instead of just giving them the one way that I solve a problem. Awesome. So like giving them some freedom to explore. Mm-hmm. And you might, and it might seem sometimes more wasting time or something like that, but in essence, you're fostering this curiosity. That's which you don't want ever the kids to lose that, do you? No, definitely not. Did you ever see that in your classrooms? Did you ever see you know, teachers that did that for you? Um, not really until, like, way later in my math career. Mm-hmm. Um, I have seen it in college some. I took discrete math, mm-hmm. and we got a lot of that where I got to explore problems. And my teacher, you know, she encouraged us to, like, look at problems in our own way and just wanted us to figure things out for ourselves as opposed to her telling us how to do it. Who was that teacher? Let's shout out to him. Uh, Dr. Shepardson. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Very good. Kudos to Dr. Shepardson. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, thanks for sharing, Claire. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Kaylee, thank you for uh, being willing to come and share a little bit about what you learned at the conference. Uh, I'm excited for uh, the listeners to hear uh, what you have to share and because I know we talked a little bit, but Before we do that, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, my name is Kaylee Obrey, and I'm from Brandon, Mississippi, and I'm an elementary education major with a math and science concentration. Yes. And after graduation, I plan on applying for grad school and hopefully get a um, grad assistant internship, and then after graduation, hopefully be a third grade math and science teacher. Fantastic. All right. We're two for two, uh, Claire, before you was already... (laughs) <laughs> about that as well. So, all right. So, I asked you to come on the uh, podcast because we're thinking about. We went to NCTM. It's an opportunity to develop as a professional, and thinking about what is like the thing that stood out to you as, um, as like a highlight, as a mile marker of your professional. But what's that one thing that stood out to you at the conference? Well, one session in particular stood out to me, and it was called Revamp Your Instruction Strategies That Support Understanding Influency with Multiplication. And it was, um, the speakers were um, professors from Austin P University. And I chose this session because we started, I chose to attend this session because we had just started talking, uh, introducing multiplication to our students in my field placement. Okay. And... Um, I wanted to educate myself as much as I could on, like, effective multiplication instruction so I could maybe help my clinical instructor or um, just talk to her about it. Um, Can I stop you there? I already like that idea of developing as a professional. Like, I'm going to go learn something, not only to better myself, but to share with somebody else. I I just, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, and I like, we, me and my clinical instructor, we like to have conversations about that. And she'll ask me questions like, are you learning this in, like, in your classes? And so I wanted to take this opportunity and maybe share something with her that I learned. Okay. Um, in the set, like the first part of the session, we discussed like what does fluency mean, and because I feel like fluency is very misunderstood, especially like before that session, I thought fluency was um, being able to just spit out your multiplication facts. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and um, the NCTM defines fluency as being able to choose flexibly among methods and strategies to solve um, multiplication problems. So giving students the opportunity to choose which method of 
like they would like to solve multiplication as long as they're as long as they can produce accurate answers. Mm-hmm. Um, another point the students made or the speakers made was to involve real world problems like as much as pos- as much as possible. So like they had us do an activity where we had to come up with um, items that we could multiply in the real world between like two and twelve. And I like this activity because it, it got us all thinking, like, what we could use in our classrooms. Um, and then... Wow, this was stack, this is a stack session. Yeah, they had a lot, <laughs> a lot in there. A lot in there. And then um, we discussed, like, the order and how to teach multiplication that would be effective because, like, beforehand I would thought you would just teach from zero to... 12 like just going in order so but what you're saying is like what is it for all the numbers multiplied by zero yes with all the numbers multiplied by one with all the numbers multiplied by two by three so it's almost like your times table you're just kind of filling yeah, it up just going, going down. straight down the line yeah. but um they said it was more effective to teach like zero one and twos and then go to fives and tens and then just like carry on like kind of um building off of what you master I guess. In hindsight, kind of makes sense, right? Because mm-hmm. you know, zero, ones, and twos, we, you know, we like multiplying by one is, it's fairly easy. Yeah. And then multiplying by two is doubling. And then we think about, well, we've got fives, like yeah. two fives built, well, four fives, you know, <laughs> if you got all your fingers and toes, like all built into us. And so we, we're used to thinking up five, 10, 15, 20. And so now, and then tens, and so. And I feel like it's easier for students to get like counting by fives and tens mm-hmm. better than threes and fours yeah so and, and then, then you have those to lean on right yeah. you have like i those are some benchmarks i know i know what five times three is so maybe thinking about five times four or, or you know three times four is not that hard right yeah and then to end the session we just talked about the do's and don'ts of multiplication so like don't give time test or and then we just had like a open discussion well if we can't do time test how are we going to assess um, like the, like they're fluently, like, like they're able to. The level of fluency. Or yes. Something. Okay. And so they just talked about doing interviews, like one-on-one interviews, like asking them, like, and so that will give teachers a good understanding if they, if the student knows. Yeah. Well, here's your definition. Can you flexibly choose between those? Yes. And then I'll, you know, if they're a one-trick pony and they're only doing the same thing over and over again, like, okay, are you, you don't have this definition down yet, right? So. And then for the timed part, like, maybe having them beat their own time. Mm-hmm. So, like, the timer going up instead of counting down. Ah, yeah. yeah. And then it's it's on competing with themselves yes. and not, you know, themselves yesterday, not the other people in the room. Yeah. Like, Slamming like the pencil down. and. All right. So you learn a bunch of stuff. You got stuff you can share. That's great. But now, what does this mean for your future classroom and our future students? Well, hopefully as a third grade or future third grade math teacher, um, multiplication is a very important standard that students need to master in the classroom. And so taking this opportunity um, to attend this session really helped me. And, like, I know how to approach multiplication instruction instruction and be effective because like in class yesterday we talked about you may be highly qualified but that doesn't make you highly effective Mm -hmm. so taking these opportunities for professional development and putting them into our teaching can make us highly effective great like it thank you for sharing you're welcome all right amelia Thank you. Thank you again for uh, being willing to come in and uh, talk to the listeners out there and sharing what you learned at the NCTM Regional Conference in Nashville a couple weeks ago now. Excited to hear about everything that you learned. you got a couple things that you want to share, but first, why don't you introduce yourself? My name is Amelia Martin, and I'm from Grenada, Mississippi. I'm an elementary education major with concentrations in English and Social Studies, And after graduation, um, I plan to go to grad school at Ole Miss, and I'm going to apply for graduate assistantship at Ole Miss. Um, And then after that, I plan to teach third or fourth grade um, somewhere in the Oxford area. All right. Okay. Fantastic. So 
All right, we've set the stage. Uh, we went to the conference. What is that one thing? And I know, I know we've talked before. I have two things <laughs> that stood out to you at the conference. Um, well, the first workshop we went to was by Dr. Anita Wagger, and we talked about ways to incorporate reading into the math classroom. And um, just as like a pre-service teacher, I found it difficult to um, put different subject areas into math lessons and vice versa. Um, and then Can I ask you why? Does it feel like artificial? Um, you know, I think so. Like, yeah, we're just trying to, like, you know, shoehorn it in. Yes. And, and by the way, I'm so happy you're doing this. That, <laughs> and this is, and, and if Anita is out there listening to this, I did not ask her to select your <laughs> your session. Uh, but I am excited. Uh, Anita Wagger was my uh, uh, dissertation uh, advisor, dissertation chair. So this is makes me so excited. Anyway, sorry, Amelia, I, I interrupted you. Um, and then also, like, in my current field placement, I'm in a math classroom. And, like, the kids will read their AR books, but the math teacher doesn't really read to them that often. Um, and I feel like if she did, you know, that might, like, help them understand what they're doing better. You know, like, incorporating the reading into their math lessons. Yeah. Well, it might not be her. I mean, in, from my perspective, before Anita, and I've heard Anita talk about this before and uh, some other colleagues, but I wouldn't have thought, like, if I'm teaching math, I wouldn't have thought, like, well, why would I? I'm in the math class. And, and, and that might be my shallow, compartmentalized thinking, but the fact that this kind of opened up and think, like, oh, we can do this. That's, that's kind of interesting. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. I mean, my bad. <laughs> um, and then the session really also helped me realize that integrating ELA into um, the math class is not as hard as it seems, and it can also be really fun for the kids. Cool. Like, lower the bar a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, this I can do this. Okay. Um, and well, then, l- Let's go and jump into that. Okay, so what does that mean for your future classroom? Um, <laughs> well, I feel like if I incorporate these things into um, my lesson plans for the day, then, you know, it just might, like, help them calm their nerves, especially, like, before a test. Like, I was always worried about, oh, this test is going to be horrible. But I feel like if the teacher would have read to us or, you know, did something fun before it, it wouldn't have been, like, I wouldn't have been worried about it. So yeah. that's, like, something I plan to do. Yeah, what if, you, yeah, you, like, read the book of that you you used to help teach the content that you're going to go take an assessment on and you're going to take this test on. Let's read a book first. I'm like, wow, what a way to calm everybody yeah that, I, I never would have thought that all right what's the what's the other session um it was actually your session um where we Again, discussed i did not tell her <laughs> to pick any session so um, but we... i'm excited i'm excited thank you amelia and we discussed our reasoning for teaching um and i have like a five page philosophy statement so it like really you want to read helped. that now you want to read no i'm good okay <laughs> So it, like, really helped me find my reasoning, like, behind the whole five pages. Um, And it helped me understand that, like, our reasoning for teaching is more than just making sure the students pass the test. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, like, my main reasoning, I feel like, for teaching is to help children love school like I did. And then also to make them feel safe at school and to know you don't have to worry. You'll always be safe. Nice. Nice. And I appreciate the fact that you're willing to share that. And and even the statement that you said before, what is the statement behind the five-page paper? Like here in our program, everyone has to write this philosophy statement paper or philosophy of education paper. And when I see students in when they're in the class that you're currently in, I like ask them, hey, what's in that paper? And they're like, I don't know. Or they, they really haven't thought about it since they turned it in. And, well, that's a shame, right? The fact that we have these beliefs, we have this this big paper that we wrote, these beliefs, and what does it mean? How do we boil it down? And I love the fact that you boil it down and you have the statement and it's your first draft statement that you are willing to share with the listeners out there. And I, I mean, the fact that you're willing to put it out there and say, hey, this is what I believe. And now to see, and then the part of the, the, the talk that I gave was about actions, right? And see like, what is your actions? How do they line up with those beliefs? I mean, that's that's where the rubber meets the road, right? And so I guess that goes into actions, Amelia. So what is that? What does this mean for your future classroom? Um, I just like want all of my kids to understand that, like, even if you try your hardest, it might not end up how you want it, you know, and that's okay in the long run. Mm-hmm. It's going to be okay. Yeah. You learn from our mistakes mm-hmm. and keep moving forward. 
which is what we're, which is what we're doing the class. I mean, even thinking about you know what we're uh, you know what we learned at the conference. I mean, I'm already thinking about how do I need to change things that I've done. Not that I made mistakes, but it's just I can be better. You know, and that's like what I like about going to conferences is thinking about how do we keep getting better and how do we not be satisfied with where we are but keep moving forward. So, thank you for being willing to share. Yes, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Monroe, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy day to, uh, to talk with me uh, about uh, our experience at NCTM in Nashville. We talk about it as an opportunity for professional development. We're not just going to go and develop automatically. We have to take that opportunity. And you told me about something that I want you to share with listeners. Um, but first, can you introduce yourself? Sure. And your complete title here at the University of Michigan? Sure. I'm Ann Monroe, Assistant Dean, Director of Assessment, and Associate Professor of Teacher Education, former third grade teacher, where I also taught math to third graders. Fantastic. So this is, we're just building, building on everything. So we had a presentation. It was Candy's Cook uh, locally, uh, who's a local math coach uh, and a student here uh, and alumni of our uh, School of Education. And you and myself, we had a presentation on productive struggle. And during that presentation, you brought up something that you had to think about a little bit, but then was kind of an aha moment. Can you share that moment? Sure. So at this NCTM uh, regional conference, we were talking about productive struggle. And uh, the particular um, subject that I was in charge of going around and facilitating discussion upon was how you get students to be... um, users of mathematics. How do you promote this idea that every student is a doer, I guess you would say, a doer yes. of mathematics, sorry, a doer Expanding of mathematics. Expanding this idea. We're right. not just going to be followers of algorithms, but Correct. being a doer of mathematics is bigger than maybe what we think about. Right. So what does it mean to be a doer of mathematics, and how how can we um, promote the idea that all children are doers of mathematics in order to um, alleviate shame associated with not knowing and encourage uh, students to see themselves as mathematicians, yeah. uh, no matter what grade level, no matter what age or, or level of mathematics. And so I was going around and facilitating this discussion with different groups, and one particular teacher that was in one of the groups, he mentioned um, that he felt that what really helped with um, promoting this idea of doers of mathematics at his school was that they did standards-based grading. And when I originally saw that, I thought, oh, he's not on the right track. (laughs) Well, oh, dear, I'm going to have to steer this conversation. What does standards-based grading have to do with being a doer of mathematics? Because we had talked about things like, um, you know, focusing on um, the process, not the product of a a math problem, or um, having uh, math put in the context of real world, real life, what's really happening with students, bringing the outside in. And so um, he says this standards-based uh, grading was, is really really helps promote doers of mathematics, and I, I would really took me a second. And then I listened though, so I stopped and I listened to what he had to say. It's a good teaching. It's move. a good teaching move to listen. And um, he started explaining that his kids with standards based grading, and a lot of the interesting thing is that a lot of the teachers at the table weren't really um, familiar with it or how it really worked. They'd heard of it, but weren't familiar with the actual ins and outs of how it works. In a, in a school, and so they were very interested in it and asking you questions. As, as I listened, it, it, it just dawned on me. This is exactly, exactly fits exactly with doers of mathematics because he talked about a particular child when they were working on a particular content piece in math in October. This one child was not really, it wasn't clicking for this child, but they mm-hmm. worked and they worked and a lot of the kids met the standard at that stage in October because that's when they were really concentrating on that particular yeah, yeah. skill. Later on, April rolls around, and they're working on new skills, but they're in, they're obviously connected with some of the older skills that they were working on. And this young man who had not really uh, mastered that particular standard early in October when most of the kids were mastering it, it hit him, and he got it, mm-hmm. and the connections were made. And he was able, the teacher was able to go back and reclaim that standard for him. And the way that the teacher said it was, I was able to give him credit for that standard, meaning mm-hmm. change sort of, uh, even though it's not in a uh, typical grade, but sort of change his um, standing with that standard. Yeah, yeah. You know, change his grade, in quotes, if you will, for that standard. And so the child gets credit for he, The child sees that, oh, I'm, I'm going to get this math. Right. I might not get it just like everyone else or at the same pace as everyone else. 
but I am a doer. Mm -hmm. If I keep and I persist, which is what we were talking about, is persisting in, you know, math tasks, even though it's hard, that productive struggle. If I persist in this struggle, I'm going to be in the same place everyone else is at the end. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have achieved that standard. And so this idea of standards-based grading, it perfectly aligns with doers of mathematics, even though my initial reaction was, oh, no, that's not what we're talking about. It's exactly what we're talking about. So it's the idea of, of talking about process, uh, positioning it in terms of children develop at different rates. And I was literally just teaching my foundations of education class about mm-hmm. the principles of um, development. And one of them is that everyone develops at different rates. There you go. Development is gradual and orderly. And so for this particular child, it happened for him. It didn't happen in October. It happened in April. But it happened all the same. Mm-hmm. And so he sees himself, if I, if I you know, persist, if I work at this, I'm going to be in the same place everyone else is by the end of the year. That's awesome. He's a doer of mathematics. Well, and th- what gets me there is that, okay, so you have this in your foundations of ed class, and we mm-hmm. th- we're, and the other ones we've been talking about, how do you connect this to what you're already going to, what you do in the classroom, and you already made that connection because you're talking about in the foundations class, you have this belief where, or this thing that we're saying like, hey, development is going to happen in its own time for for each kid Mm -hmm. and this is an actual thing that you can point to like standards based grading basically facilitates or fosters this belief it lines up with this belief that hey they didn't hit it now but uh, later they do Mm -hmm. you can hey just because we're not going to bucket ourselves by time we can go back and and change that so for those of you that are not you know, doing standards-based grading, it'd be some sort of rubric where it says that this child has shown evidence of meeting the standard, right? right. Some sort of score like that. Mm-hmm. And that's what's amazing is that, the, and maybe the mind-blowing part for you and for me might line up is the fact that doers of mathematics doesn't necessarily mean we're going to do something in con- constrained to a specific time, right? right? That we can right. expand. Like right. when, when you're going to be doing it, it might change. Right. And that it happens over time, that our growth happens over time. A lot of times we have things set up in school where if you don't get it at a certain time, you've failed in that area. Right. You haven't failed. And that's it. Yeah, yeah and that's it. And then we're, we're done and we move on. And mm-hmm. so you've, a piece of you is gone. You know, you've, you feel like you're a failure in an area when you're not. You're right. just not there yet. Mm-hmm. And so it perfectly connects this idea of, of promoting pride uh, as opposed to shame in the classroom, right. um, you know, connecting this idea of being a doer with someone who persists Mm -hmm. and doesn't give up, Um, you know, and then it also, with standards-based grading, it goes along with a lot of other things that make sense. When you do look at development and that, you know, development in all areas, whether it be cognitive development, physical development, emotional development, social development, you know, it happens, uh, you know, gradually over time at different rates for different people and usually in some sort of organized way. Mm -hmm. And so when you have standards-based grading, it's more of an authentic way of looking at how people learn and people learn you know in those ways gradually at different rates in an orderly way over time and so standards-based grading fits that it's a more natural fit for how learning really happens instead of like you said you know bucketing in these boxes of time when we're going to do things that's not a natural way of learning yeah did you get it or not and we we've also talked about this idea of yet language right i don't know how to do this yet i don't can't tie my shoes yet right there's an assumption that we're going to get this. Exactly. And and that opens up possibilities for that student. Exactly. In the future. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Candies, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your busy day to being willing to share uh, some of your learnings from the conference on the podcast. Um, but before we dive into it, I'm excited to hear you share, but before we dive into it, can you just introduce yourself uh, to the listeners? Yeah, sure. My name's Candice Cook, and I'm the math coach for Oxford School District. This is my first year as a math coach, and before that I taught. Um, I was an educator for 15 years. So, And yeah. a proud alum. Yes. Multiple times. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. And, yeah. So we're excited. Uh, we're excited that, uh, again, you get a chance to share here. And I'm ex- excited for the opportunity to present with you at the Absolutely. regional conference. Uh, we talked about uh, productive struggle. We right. talked about how do we avoid shame in uh, or promoting thinking about the shame paradox and thinking about you know hey we're willing to say we're not good at math but we're not willing to say we're not good at reading right. we really dove into that and thinking about what does it mean to uh, manage shame in the classroom and think about promoting productive struggle we've we've, we've had a good time with you and I and uh, Dr. Monroe and presenting right. that 
multiple times. Yes, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, and we lot. learn every time. Yeah. Uh, and just, uh, but so we got a chance to go to the conference. We got a chance to present. But then, just curious, what were some of the things, or and you talked about two things, but what are some of the things that you identify as? Hey, these are the things that I learned at the conference. Well, um, two of the things that are like aha moments or like takeaways for me. One was um, your session on um, aligning my beliefs with my actions. I know that's not the topic of it. <laughs> that's a, it I mean, again, and I'm yeah. just saying it to the listeners, I did not prompt her to no, choose No, mine. no, no. But yeah, we're talk, we call it stoking the fire, you know, aligning your beliefs and actions. So, yes. Yeah, go ahead. So I really enjoyed that one and it helped me like go back to my true purpose of why I became an educator. And during some of that time, you know, your actions don't always, well, they're shoved out of alignment. So your actions or beliefs are sometimes shoved out of alignment and actually uh, going back and doing something about getting those back into alignment that, and talking about my true purpose in becoming an educator. So I was able to refine that a bit. Um, the second um, session that really stuck with me. Can we me, stop? Can we go sure. back to a second? And yes. just to say, you know, just to make sure, like when we talk about getting shoved out of alignment, it's not a bad thing. Right. You know? yeah, it's no. not a bad thing. And that's why we go to conference. That's why exactly. we do this sort of thing and develop. And yeah, I'm looking and the, uh, the recorder is, is right behind a, a stack of books that, uh, <laughs> That you're probably hoping there's a bunch of shoves within there that that take your either the beliefs or actions out of Absolutely. alignment, but it's putting them back together. That's how we we grow. Sorry, right? Didn't mean and to... growing as a you know that's good and growing as an educator and definitely growing in my new position, mm-hmm. um, trying to learn some things as a math coach. Like what do I do in helping um, teachers hone their skills? So you know it's just it, this has all been a learning experience for yeah, me. Yeah. yeah. Um, the second session that I really enjoyed was um, the president-elect Trina Wilkinson. Wilkerson. Yeah. Wilkerson. Uh, um, Wilker- and- it could be Wilkerson. I, I need to look that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but new, pre- new president-elect of NCTM yes. gave a great talk. But yeah. Yes, and she talked. She also talked about productive struggle and that productive struggle in her in the title of her. Um, Session is what prompted me to go to it because I wanted to see how her presentation would, was aligned to ours. And so um, I really enjoyed hers and I took away, even the, even from hers, ways like helping students understand that it is okay to struggle and helping them through that struggle mm-hmm. is what I really took away from her um, from her session. I took a lot of notes on it. So. Do you remember any of the way any of the specific strategies she had? Um, I don't. I'll have to go back and read those. Yeah, yeah. You know the specific things, mm-hmm. other than helping students know that it's okay to struggle because sometimes we think struggling in mathematics means that I'm not good at it, I can't do it. But yeah. helping students gain confidence, like when you are struggling, that's when your brain really is growing and uh-huh. you're learning. So helping them through those struggles. Yeah. And I think about all, like, uh, we're coming, I'm loving it because we're coming into NBA basketball season. Uh-huh. And, like, yeah, you know, on Instagram, it's, it's all these, like, athletes, like, showing how they're working so hard. They're struggling right. so And what are they doing? They're struggling so hard so they can perform. Right. right? They don't, th- and there's not, once they figure out that, you know, they have certain talents, they have certain abilities, but then you've got to work to get to a certain point. And the exactly. struggle, there's, there's pride in the struggle. Right. And, like, I guess that maybe that's why we talk about <laughs> celebrating the struggle. Exactly, <laughs> In yeah. our presentation. Yeah. And that makes me think of one of the things she did talk about was having enough struggle, well, having some successes at the beginning, mm-hmm. and then so that when students get to that struggle, they don't just completely stop. Right. So they've been successful, like, up leading up until that struggle, and I know that I've been successful this far, so I'm going to keep going to build whatever that strength is. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be multiplication, addition, whatever, yeah. like to push through their... Um, through their struggle, yeah, right, yeah, to push exactly. through, yeah, have that, uh, and I, something that I've saw uh, recently, or just some of the words that are out there, and like being that warm demander, right, uh-huh. in order to get students to, you know, engage in struggle, that that right. perseverance that you know in the Common Core talks about being uh, 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 make sense of problems and perseverance solving right. them, and so, something right. we highlight in our presentation and. And, you know, there, there's some character traits. There's some, like, mm-hmm. virtues, like, you know, perseverance. I mean, right. like, 
it's it's something like ingrained within students and how do we bring it out of them and how do we create an environment for that to happen right and that is big and leading into those like the right questions to ask students so when they get to that point to where they feel like they can't go on like knowing as a teacher what type of questions or even the right questions to ask students mm -hmm. to get them to move forward right so how do you think those two things that you had, and, and you touched on a little bit, mm -hmm. but maybe it's anything else explicit you want to say, that helps inform what you're going to do? So how are you taking these things that maybe shoved you professionally? How are you yeah. going to put them into action? So for me, I guess it's a combination of the two. So with our presentation, and um, we talked about five different ways um, to the, we took with, I forgot the things that we call them. We call them the strategies uh yeah, five, five different ways, ways to pr promote uh, doers of mathematics. Yes, yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that I'm doing right now is I'm going to have to uh, facilitate a professional PD mm -hmm. for teachers in the Oxford School District. So one of the things that we talked about during our session was having those engaging tasks, mm -hmm. meaningful tasks for yeah, students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what my PD is going to be, in, yeah. increasing student engagement through meaningful math tasks. Right. Not just giving a bunch of uh, of problems, uh, of, problems of yeah. like, uh, hey, do do all of them. The odds are in the back. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know, some really good, some right. media. We what well, I would call messy task, right? Yes. Some some problems that you can really dive deep into. Right. Yeah. So that's that's what I've taken away and ordered some books and <laughs> <laughs> that's right to help me uh, present these ideas to teachers and to kind of get students involved as doers versus mm -hmm. just working some problems. Yeah. And what's yeah. cool is, uh, you know, it's like we we put on the presentation, but we yeah. benefited where we were asking people, like, where do you find these good the good tasks, right, right? these good things? And yeah. and to get a collection of tasks that right. we received. Now, we have this, like, almost like treasure trove of tasks, mm -hmm. of places we can go for good stuff. And we're sharing that. So that we, we had a handout that we created, a, vir uh, a virtual handout, a Google Doc, basically, where we right. put all this stuff. And that's available, uh, will be available in the show notes. Too. Okay. So yeah. people can access it. Absolutely. Listen to us. All right. Well, thank you for taking some time on your busy day. We yes. appreciate it. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity again. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. That was cool. So thankful for Claire, Kaylee, Amelia, Anne, and Candy's being able to be willing to share these moments, these moments of development from the conference. It's kind of a raw experience at times. I mean, and think about what Anne was sharing about, you know, kind of having a, not a misconception, but basically going to like tell someone, hey, you're, you're wrong. You're wrong. Think about this. But then having the uh, humility to say, you know what? They're exactly right. And I just got this professional shove that made me rethink like, yeah, that's standards based grading is how you can enact this belief that being that this idea of who is a doer of mathematics and what they look like and what are the, what are the things that they do and how we can show that thing like using standards based grading is a way to make that belief come to life. And it took that quote that comment from the participant in our uh, presentation to make that come alive and and on a side note all the presentations that were referenced uh, that I participated in so soaking the fire and the five ways to promote productive struggle uh, those can be found on amadonplanet.com uh, we'll have a link to it in the show notes at amadonplanet.com forward slash episode 10 um, just excited that you uh, that any listener got to hear that. I mean, you're just thinking about Claire and Claire's uh, idea about this um, the presentation about curiosity and, you know, if we show students something, we could, we could be robbing them from other ways of exploring uh, around a topic, right? So this curiosity, you know, the, with the example of the toy, if we show them one function, they'll use that one function, but if we just give them the toy, they'll discover all the functions and probably even more, right, of ways that we can use uh, the toy. It reminds me of that book, uh, Not a Box and Not a Stick, you know, and the person, the one person says, it, you know, to the bunny, hey, that's, 
that's a that's a just a stick. No, it's not a stick, and it's a it's a horse, or that's not a stick. No, it's not, it, that's just a stick. No, it's not a stick. It's a dragon, or it's a walking stick to go up a mountain. You know, same thing for not a box. It's just a box. It's not a box. It's a rocket ship, and you know, having that like ability to be curious and you want it, I mean, such an asset for kids. And why do we, you know, we don't want to take that away. And how can we foster that in, within our classrooms or even within ourselves? I mean, I remember, um, uh, Michael Thomas, he was a professor at the university of Wisconsin. Uh, when we were coming up with research questions for our dissertation, he would say, write out your, you know, write out your research question on this, you know, line of paper. And he'd give us scissors. He'd say, cut it up. Now move all the, move all the, uh, all the words around, change them up. Play with it. See if you come up with something new. And like, it was amazing. Like you say, he's like, oh, like look at that. That's a completely different study. That's a completely different thing if you change these words around. And maybe that's the study you should be doing and not the study you, you know, you came in with. And it was cool. It was super cool. And this idea of play. Uh, and I know uh, my better half right now is doing some uh, classes and things. And she's looking at, you know, the idea of, of play as a focus in the classroom. And just how important that is. And, and so, I mean, that presentation that Claire, uh, you know, came up with or um, identified as her opportunity to develop, to develop as a professional was, you know, kind of right in line with that. And then looking at what Kaylee shared with regards to um, thinking about fluency, you know, and I mean, I'll be honest, I learned something about fluency right there, right? And so that's what's cool too, is we all, <laughs> when we get these, you know, collective, uh, collective ideas uh, or these collective experiences where we've developed as a professional and then we share them. And now you're sharing your highlights with somebody else and I'm sharing my highlights with someone else and we all get to learn even more from the experiences. And that's another thing that I like about this thing, about sharing these things is that we're all learning more from them. And this idea about what fluency is and giving the definition and it's not just, fluency is not just knowing the standard algorithm. It's not just being able to repeat, you know, uh, numbers off of a flashcard. No, it's being able to do it a problem multiple ways and being, you know, fluent in it. So like, you know, when you think, well, my kid is fluent, he knows all his facts. Well, do they know how to represent them in multiple ways? Can they know how to use them in, in multiple manners? Or is they, can they just use this one path? They're just using the one path, and by definition, that's not fluency, right? So that's helpful for me, and, you know, helping, for me, I deal with a lot of parents because I'm in the parent circles, and they're wondering, like, what, why are they teaching all these different ways of doing it? Why don't they just teach the standard algorithm? And I have a, I have a better response now. I had a response before, but I have a better response now. Uh, and then thinking about Amelia and, and the way that Amelia used, was thinking about books and being able to use them, that just got me thinking, you know, um, we're going to be looking at some children's literature this week because that same presentation that Amelia brought up uh, from uh, Anita Wagger, uh, Dr. Anita Wagger from Vanderbilt, like about how to use children's literature to think about math, not only math, but also social justice issues. We're going to be using that same exercise or that same assignment and task that we did in her workshop. We're going to be doing it this week in my class. And what Amelia brought out was you know, if, if you use literature to help teach mathematics, well, now you can use literature to calm people down before a test. Hey, let's read one of those books that we use to teach this concept. Wow, how cool is that? That we're making these, we're, we're making more connections uh, to the content because now we have a story connected with it and there's not a lot of things more powerful than a story. And, and also the, just the act of reading a book and getting students like almost in tune because when you read a good book, everyone's you know uh, tuned into the story. And there's not, I think there's some research that says you don't uh, don't daydream during stories. Like you don't really daydream during a good TV show, right? You're kind of focused in on the story. So getting everyone into focus and focusing on that story, and now they could be ready to really show what they know on their test or celebration, as we talked about last in the last episode. Um, and then we already talked about ANDs and thinking about standard-based grading. Um, I like standard-based grading. I like thinking about it, like uh, promoting it and seeing it in some of the classrooms that I have experience with. And just is just another reason. Like now we can say, hey, we can connect it to this idea of expanding what it means to be a doer of mathematics and not bucketing, uh, demonstrating experience in a certain amount of time, right? That we know, oh, I've seen this. I see uh, expertise in this objective. Now we can go back and give credit 
for that student, for that objective. And that's not, oh, I'm not just changing their grade. No, I'm just giving them credit for what they know now. And that's just standard happened to you before, but they have it now, so it's okay. And having that justification for why you're doing what you're doing. And then finally looking at candies and thinking about some of the things uh, she was thinking about with regards to tasks and, you know, how to promote productive struggle. Um, you know, we, we've done a lot of presentations on productive struggle. And again, some of those uh, presentations are on amp.planet.com. You can look at our Celebrate the Struggle <laughs> series, as you want to say. Um, but looking at what she did and, and even some of the discussion we had around messy tasks, uh, I just, just convicted me more that I need to expose more people to what a messy task is and maybe even doing something uh, through the podcast or through the video or something to show, hey, this is what a messy task, just in case there's people out there that haven't experienced it, but really an authentic task that takes a, a moment to dive into. And it's not just the, you know, page of 10 problems of three digit multiplication using a standard algorithm. It's not that. It's uh, like one that we've used in our classroom or my methods classroom is that you have a thousand dollars that you're going to use on classroom supplies for you know this classroom and here's a list of how much supplies cost how much you know how much of each thing would you use um you know and why are you purchasing them what's the reasoning behind it and so there's a lot there that you have to do for this task right you're going to spend the thousand dollars you're going to have justification for why you're doing it you're going to make sure you're using the proper um uh, operations to get how much you're spending in each category. You're going to make a graph of it so you can demonstrate, hey, here's how much we're using in each category and showing how much of the stuff we use. You see, there's a lot to that task. It's not just a, you know, do this algorithm sort of thing. And so just convicted me, like, we need to expose more people to these tasks. We need to get in them. We need to show why, I mean, and some of those tasks even get into back to Claire and thinking about, prompting curiosity and giving openness to explore the task and, and maybe giving them opportunities to push on the task saying, well, why is this the only list? Can we go find other things? And now they're thinking, well, what if we want to do this within our classroom? What might that look like? Or what if we want to have these certain values in our classroom? Wouldn't that mean we would do this, this, and this? And like all of that creativity and um, exploration, it's going to lead to more math, but it's also going to lead to meaningful experiences which also helps with having effective learning. So I really had a good time at the conference, had a good time presenting, had a good time learning. Um, I guess one thing I did want to share, one of my uh, moments of development, I guess you could say, from the experience, and I opened up my notebook here because I took pretty darn good notes. There was a presentation on... Uh, Basically, like lesson study, which lesson study is where a teacher will teach a lesson, a lesson that's been pretty refined, right? And they're going to teach a lesson and they're going to get critiqued on it. And it almost could be like Iron Chef, where people are like in the stands looking at this lesson and, you know, they know all the information around it. There's commentary on it and they're, they're watching how students are reacting to things. I mean, lesson study really is popular in Japan. There's lots of stuff written on that. And now, you know, and people have been bringing it to uh, the U.S. or been doing, doing it in the U.S. And the presentation I was uh, attending, um, uh, a colleague, uh, Kendall Brown, um, was, explore, w was looking at how they're using lesson study to promote uh, good mathematics, but we're also looking at uh, promoting equity within the classroom. And within this lesson study cycle where... You teach a lesson, you get some, and, and in, their, in their sequence, they would have actually have like a pre-lesson where they'd have some, like a mock, like almost like a, they do, they mock teach this lesson to a group, like a setup group, and they'd say, okay, here's what I'm going to do, and they do it, and they get some feedback on that mock lesson before they actually teach it for real, so it's almost like a run-through at like football practice, like a, the Thursday run-through before the Friday football game where they run through the game plan, they, they would do that get some feedback, and then before they would actually teach the actual lesson, they teach the actual lesson, and then they get feedback, and then they think about how would they refine it for future use. But the cool thing about this is they used a couple different things that I thought were interesting. One was they used improvement science, um, and so that's been, a, I guess, a buzzword that I've heard lately, this idea of improvement science, and they had some citations for it, and, um, and actually have a book 
that's on my desk now uh, from some of those citations. But basically, the idea of proven science, it's centered on like continuous inquiry and learning. And basically, you want to fail fast and learn fast. Like, here's an idea. Here's what we thinking it means success. We want to try it out. And lesson study is perfect for that. We want to try this idea out. We want to, let's see if it works or not. If it doesn't, good. We can improve upon it. If it does, fantastic. We can keep it. And so let's, and let's keep learning and we'll keep moving forward uh, these ideas rather than let's just think about it for a long, long time and never put it into play. No, if we got a good idea, let's put it into play. Let's see if it uh, works. If it does, great. If it doesn't, fantastic. We know that doesn't work. We're going to use something else. And so using this idea of improvement science, but they also, and by the way, improvement science, that's, I think that's how I like to teach. I like to just, I like pilots. I like to put things into play. We don't know until we actually put them in action. So let's put things in action. And I can think of four or five things that I've done and I continuously do in my teaching where it's been every semester is a cycle of improvement. And even sometimes within we'll have cycles where I'm like, okay, I need to do some tweaking. And that's kind of how what I see is good teaching. Um, but now they got some words around it. And actually, act, you know, there's some structures around it too with measurement and things like that. But I like this idea of, hey, we don't know. Let's put it into play. Let's pilot it. Let's get it going and let's make it better. What the cool thing about this, uh, another th cool thing I took out from this presentation, there's a lot in this presentation. I mean, I got pages of notes, but the one thing that they did within this lesson study where people are looking at and giving feedback is they would have a commentators. The commentators were not positioned as know-it-alls, but they were, they were experts and they could come, they could comment on these specific parts of, um, the lesson. And one of the commentators was focused in on the mathematics and another commentator was focused on equity and specifically focusing in on some focal students, focus focal students, and giving feedback on how well the lesson did at reaching or helping those focal students learn the stated objectives. And I really like that. The fact that there was someone in the room who was focused in on this aspect of are these kids learning? Not just are they engaged, but are they, are they engaged in the learning towards the specific objectives, right? Um, and it could be adjusted objectives based off of needs and challenges. Uh, but are they learning? And so I really like that aspect of it. And, um, you know, there's, I, I, well, what's nice thing about this is now I saw Kendall Brown uh, has some expertise in this. I, I know Kendall. And we're going to be thinking about this idea of improvement science coming up in some projects coming forward. And I'm excited to, you know, learn more about improvement science. I got my book on my desk I'm going to read into. But when I have questions because of experiences like this, I can reach out to Kendall and say, hey, Kendall, I got some questions for you. You got some resources on this. Uh, what about this, this, and this? If I'm thinking about that, have you ever experienced this when you're doing, uh, when you're thinking about the idea of the equity commentator or, you know, when you're thinking about failing fast and learning fast, what are some, some things that you've, that you've learned in that process, right. That have facilitated, um, uh, good improvements, right. Rather than just, oh, we're just failing a lot and we're not really putting into action. Like what are some checks and balances that you've got put into place? All right. So that's a lot. There's a lot of learnings, right. And that's, what's great about going to a conference, uh, and or just having this structured opportunity to develop. And like I said before at the beginning of the podcast, is anyone that's in any sort of profession or any sort of any sort of field where, I mean, things are changing and, you know, things are changing fast now. You know, technology inserts into the equation, uh, different people, uh, you know, systems get more complex. How do we learn and improve and get those professional shoves that we need to advance ourselves uh, in our beliefs and in our actions? And so I'm just glad to, for the opportunity to share this. Hopefully you found, and I'm curious, I'm wondering, did you find this interesting? Was it uh, helpful? Was it something we should do again in the future? Guess what? It'd be great to know. So why don't you, you know, review this thing or send me some questions. I, you can reach me at joel at amadonplanet.com if you're looking to email. Or you can do any of the following. You could review us in, uh, well, let's just go about this. Hey, you know what? Uh, we're just going to end the podcast. We're done with the podcast and we're talking about how to support because some of the ways to support is how you can give feedback. So let's get into that. So that's it for episode 10 of the Amazon Planet podcast. 
The show notes for this episode can be found at AmazonPlanet.com forward slash, forward slash episode 10. To support the podcast, here's where we go. You can do any or all the following. You ready? Subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Overcast, Stitcher, Google Play. You can also follow the podcast in Spotify. All that That's all there. You can share the podcast. Hey, so if you found this interesting, if you thought some of those uh, things that people learned about uh, with regard at the conference was interesting and you want to share it, go ahead and do that. Rate or review. This is where y'all come in. So review the podcast. So wherever you found the podcast, there's probably a way to review it or rate it. So especially through iTunes, iTunes would be great. So if you like this episode, go ahead and, well, one, if you listen to it, that, that's helpful. If you share it and somebody else listens to it, that's helpful. But then if you review it and you say, you know what, I really like this episode, that helps. That helps me know like, hey, this is a good one to do. Or maybe you might say, you know what, this is the worst episode. That's fine too. At least I know, right? And so we can make things better. Um, you can also like the Amadon Planet Facebook page. That'd be another way to support. Uh, there you can... And there'll be a post there. You can comment on the podcast episode there. So there'll be a specific post on the Amazon Planet Facebook page. You can comment on this episode. You can ask a question. Maybe there's some vernacular that you didn't know about. Um, you know, it could be. I don't know. Uh, so if you have a question, you can do that. Uh, you can also subscribe to the Amazon Planet email list. You can do that on AmazonPlanet.com. Or you can also do that through the Facebook uh, page, the Amazon Planet Facebook page. Hey, the other thing you can do, and I talked about this at the beginning of the podcast, you can purchase a shirt or a hoodie through the Amazon Planet store. And you can find the link in the header at AmazonPlanet.com. There will also be a link in the show notes at AmazonPlanet.com forward slash episode 10. You can also reach me in the interwebs via Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all on the handle at Amazon Planet. There's also another place where you can provide some feedback about this episode. I'm just curious to hear what you think about it. Finally, uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to episode 10 of the Amazon Planet podcast. Thanks to Candies, thanks to Ann, Kaylee, Claire, Amelia for taking the time to share how they developed as professionals at the conference. And it, it just put themselves out there. Just, I, re- I love that. Thank you so much for doing that. Thanks to Matt Mifflin for the music in this episode. And finally, thank you to all of you out there who are seeking to teach better and be the good in the world by investing in the lives of others. This world is a better place because you have decided to use the gifts you've been given to serve others. Thank you for all that you do. Peace. Is this a test, Joel? I'm just... Of the emergency broadcast system? No, you're good.